Hello, this is Dave Jacobson, and I want to talk to you today about enlightenment, and especially what enlightenment is not. And I don't want to talk so much about theory, I want to talk about my own experience with enlightenment. So most of you know I was a monk, a Buddhist monk, for two years, and before that I was a Vedic monk for more than 30 years and I've done a lot of meditation I've had a lot of interesting spiritual experiences so among the most beneficial and wonderful of these experiences are what I would call enlightenment experiences and these are described in various scriptures and so on I had my first major enlightenment experience back in 1984 and since then, I've had many others, too many to count, actually. But the ones that stand out in my mind are that one in 84, and several experiences I had recently, within the last two years, in my study of Theravada Buddhism. Now, Theravada is different from Mahayana Buddhism. It's different from Zen. It's different from any other school. Uh, probably Theravada has the most accurate records of the Buddha's original teaching of any of the schools. Uh, unfortunately, they go uh, off in a different direction through their commentaries on those scriptures, which I don't really buy at all. I go back to the original suttas. And uh, so in my study of suttas and the practices based on them, I've had some very interesting experiences that I'd like to share with you. So what is enlightenment anyway? Well, enlightenment is simply the removal of ignorance. And once you remove ignorance, then naturally we come to our natural state, which is very joyful, very beautiful. But what enlightenment is not? Uh, it's not going to make you popular. <laughs> Forget that right away. It's not going to make you rich or more beautiful. In fact, it's not going to even cure your neurosis or your personality disorders. <laughs> it's not going to all of a sudden solve all your problems. You're not going to feel blissful all the time. You're not going to be ecstatic constantly. These things will come and go. But when we're engaged in meditation, we find a refuge. All those things I mentioned are like problems, and they're problems concerning being. But enlightenment takes you out of the realm of being and non-being. Just like we may become attached to a form of being, we can also become attached to a form of non-being. I don't like processed junk food, <laughs> for example. That means I'm attached to the non-being of that kind of food. I'm attached to the non-being of people uh, being jerks, for example. Uh, I'm attached to so many non-beings, as well as so many beings. So. Does enlightenment change any of that? No. The world is still the world. It's just the way it is. And I am still I, just the way I am. That hasn't changed at all. The world of being and non-being is going on by its own momentum, by its own laws and logic. And enlightenment doesn't change any of that. Well, then what's so great about it? The thing is, it gives you a refuge from the things that we like and that we don't like, <laughs> both. And it gives us a neutral place to which we can retreat, refresh ourselves, and then come back into the dance of life with a new viewpoint, a fresh point of view, one that is not tied with to either being or non-being. 
So enlightenment for me has been a journey. The Buddha portrays it very nicely, a journey in four stages. Um, there are four levels of enlightenment portrayed in the Buddha's teaching. Stream entry. Uh, seven times, you, can, you may come back seven times after stream entry. And thrice returner, where you come back three times at the most. Once returner, where you only come back one time to finish up. And finally, arhant, where you get uh, a whole bunch of mystical realizations along with your enlightenment. And you also become free from the need to return into the dance of life and death, the samsara that we're all stuck in. So, looking at my symptoms objectively according to the description in the Buddha Suttas, I have attained once returner. In other words, I will come back again into being one more time. And then I will attain arhat. And I won't have to. I still can if I want to. But that's a different thing. So what is it like? Well, each of these levels, four levels of enlightenment, is an experience of Nibbana, or Nirvana. And the first time you experience Nirvana, well, it's like an ocean of being, an ocean of light, an ocean of ecstasy. And... It's such a beautiful thing, such an overwhelming thing. The, the very thing that we've been searching for all these lives comes to us, opens up to us, and we can experience it to our full satisfaction. So each of these experiences has been oceanic, vast, all-pervading. But each one has been more and more subtle also. The first one back in 1984 was overwhelming in its intensity, and it changed my life. I had to go back and re-experience everything in a new way. Uh, the second and third experiences were not such a big deal. In fact, the last one was so subtle, it took some time for me even to recognize it, that this was an enlightenment experience, that this was an experience of Nibbana, because it was so subtle, such a non-experience. <laughs> it wasn't like there were, you know, trumpets and angels descending from heaven proclaiming the enlightenment, you know. <laughs> It was very silent, very subtle, very pure. It's hard to describe, actually. It's impossible to describe. So I can't describe enlightenment itself because enlightenment is transcendent. And in transcendence, there are no words. It's ineffable. It's inexplicable. You can't put it into words. There aren't any words for it. So the most that you can say is it's beyond. It's beyond everything and even beyond nothing. But let's talk about nothing a little bit because nothing is probably the most similar experience. Nothing, of course, means no thing. And in Buddha's teaching, nothingness has a specific function. It's one of the higher jhanas, the non-material jhanas or states of meditation. Jhana, of course, derives from the Sanskrit word dhyana, which means meditation. So, in jhanas, there are different levels. There are the material jhanas and the non-material jhanas. The first four jhanas are material because they relate to the existence of material things, including the mind. 
The second four, however, are the non-material jhanas, which are unlimited space, unlimited consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. These four are very subtle. And, for example, in unlimited space, you realize that this whole cosmic manifestation, as vast as it is, in both space and time, is just a drop in the ocean of nothingness, emptiness. Uh, of course, it's empty in the sense that all of this is impermanent and unsatisfactory and not self. But it's also tiny, <laughs> so insignificant in the context of unlimited space. And then you realize that this unlimited space could be filled with consciousness. Consciousness of emptiness. And that's the next jhana, unlimited consciousness. Then you have the jhana of nothingness. And in nothingness, not only is there no thing, but there is also no process of becoming, no paticca samupadda, no causal reactions like we see in nature. Um, so not only is there no thing, but there cannot be anything in nothingness because there's no process by which things can come into being. So that means not only are there no things, there's no space, no time, no dimension, no uh, measurement, no comparison, no motion, no action, no past, present, or future. All these things are simply gone. So then, what is there to be aware of? Are we even aware? Can we even discern that we are aware in such a sphere. So that leads naturally to the highest level of concentration, which is neither awareness nor non-awareness. We're neither aware of something nor not aware of it. So this naturally uh, leads us to the doorstep of Nibbana. And one meditation teacher of mine, Venerable Upali, very experienced meditation teacher. He said, you begin your concentration at the beginning of the jhanas, the material jhanas, and you work up through the levels one at a time, and you acquire a certain momentum. And then when you get to the top, nothingness or neither perception nor non-perception, you jump. And then what? <laughs> well, there's a feeling like falling through empty space, drifting through nothingness. It's a very pleasant feeling. I could compare it with the feeling of being on a boat. You know how it is on a boat? The boat is always rocking back and forth, going up and down. There's this, this pleasant feeling of three-dimensional motion. Uh, unless it gets choppy and stormy, and then it's too much. <laughs> but on a nice day, uh, being out on a boat is a very pleasant sensation. And so is this pleasant sensation of falling. You, you're not going to hit anything. There's nothing there to hit. <laughs> you could just fall like that, just drift like that, unlimitedly. And of course, there's no suffering. This is probably the greatest benefit of enlightenment. I remember the first time I tried to meditate on no self, uh, that there is no self, there is no me, there is no mine, there is no uh, identity, no, no continuing sense of being from one moment to the next. 
that you can say is a self. I was sitting on a beach in Thailand and I suddenly felt such relief. Or I should say, I suddenly noticed that in that space of no self, there was also no suffering. Because who is there to suffer? No body to suffer means no suffering. Although suffering may be there, there's no one to experience it. Like someone said, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. In other words, suffering is a choice we make. It's something we do to ourselves by having a self in the first place. So when we suffer, it's because we have a desire. And a desire is different from the way it is right now. So then we create this tension that I want this, I want that. I want to be like this, or I want to be like that, or I don't want to be like this or like that, or I don't want to have a certain thing. And that's different from the way it is. So we create a tension. And at first this tension is mental. But it can also manifest in the physical body and that's when we get different types of disease and so on like that. So and not to say that uh, if you become enlightened you'll never be sick. No, even the Buddha got sick. Because if you have a body, bodies get sick, you know. But that there is no mental suffering, and probably the mental suffering is the worst suffering of all. I have a friend who is very enlightened, very advanced in various ways. But she's also suffering from depression. And to me, I've been through depression myself, I know what it's like. It's horrible. You want it to stop, and it doesn't stop. It just goes on and on. Why? Because we want things to be different from the way they are. We want to have a perfect body, or we want to have perfect intelligence, or we want to have perfect love, or something. And all these things aren't. So we try to wish them into existence. And this is a mental effort, and after a while we become exhausted, mentally exhausted. And that exhaustion, that lack of ability to even get out of bed in the morning sometimes, that's depression. That feeling of finality, that, oh, this is the way it is, this is always going to be the way it is, there's nothing I can do to change it, and it's just going on and on and on. It's horrible. So, while I have every uh, feeling of compassion for my friend, I have to say to her, well, this is because you have not made friends with nothingness. You're not comfortable with emptiness. And so, when these things come, as they will to all of us, there's some mental suffering there that, oh, I wish things were otherwise. I wish I was somewhere else. I wish I could be somebody else, anybody else. <laughs> Depression's a terrible thing. But it is a manifestation of this emptiness, this nothingness, no thingness. The thing that we want is not present. It's far away, or maybe somebody else has it and we don't. <laughs> so we beat ourselves up. And this uh, process of eye-making and mind-making is going on beneath the surface all the time. It's exhausting. It's difficult. It's hard work. Because we have to create a sense of being something where there is nothing. We have to somehow whip up a sense of existing when there is nothing to exist. And this is I. And how do we do that? Well, we designate something as mine. And then there are all these things that are mine. 
Everything I see, everything I hear, everything I feel or think is mine. Therefore, there must be an I by implication. Even though we can't see it, we can't present it to anyone who asks, where is your I? Where is yourself? There's a beautiful story about this. Bodhidharma went to China from India. And along the way, he met a king. It was normal in those days for kings to approach Buddhist masters because it would give them more credibility. You know, the people believed in Buddhism. So if the king was an, an advanced or acknowledged Buddhist master or, or meditator on some level, that would help him. Uh, so the king approached Bodhidharma and he said, I have all these worries, I have all these problems, I have all these concerns. Please help me to get rid of this, uh, this mind, this self. It's, it's causing me great anxiety. So Bodhidharma said, you know, and Bodhidharma was a great big guy. You know, he walked barefoot from India to China over the Himalayas. That's the kind of guy he was. And he carried this big stick. And so he said to the king, don't worry, come here four o'clock tomorrow morning and I'll take care of your mind. <laughs> so next morning the king came and he's sitting down in front of Bodhidharma and said, Bodhidharma said to him, all right, now go get your mind, go get yourself and bring it to me, and I'll take care of it. So the king was sitting there, concentrating, concentrating. He was sweating it out, you know, because Bodhidharma was really a powerful sage. And he had this big stick, you know. <laughs> so, uh, oh, and if you've never seen Buddhist stick fighting, wow. Uh, you definitely don't want to tangle with these guys. So the king was sweating it out for, for several hours. Finally, Bodhidharma said, just as the sun is coming up, all right, where is your mind? Where is yourself? Huh? Give it to me. I'll take care of it. And so at that moment, the king had the enlightenment that there is no self. I can't find it, he said. I don't see it anywhere. And he was joyful because now all his troubles, all his problems and anxieties were gone. And it may sound simplistic, but that's really all it takes to realize that there is no self. Oh, whew. Now I don't have to go through all that effort, all that trouble to artificially create a self. <laughs> it's really that simple but not easy because we have this habit of creating a self for many many lifetimes uh, it's so much uh, history of I this my that and so on it's very hard to let go of all that it's like a whirlpool that once it's going it, it sucks us into it it, it acquires a life of its own. It doesn't want to let us go. So, somehow or other, we have to get beyond this idea of I and mine. Not artificially. Not by just a mental attitude. Uh, it's not enough to know the philosophy and say, well, we know that the Buddha said this and that, and therefore... That's not good enough. We need the experience. We need the realization that really there is no self. And then that opens a door. That opens a door to beyond being and non-being, to authentic nothingness, no thingness, to the highest uh, form of meditation, neither awareness nor non-awareness, neither perception nor non-perception, 
neither consciousness nor unconsciousness. No? And that in turn puts us on the doorstep of Nibbana, enlightenment. <laughs>